So today we're going to be wrapping up our series called Parental Guidance. And if you haven't been with us over the summer, what we've been doing is we've been taking different ideas from different movies and films and looking at God's Word and seeing how we can improve not only in our parenting relationships, but just relationships as a whole. Because we fully, fully recognize going into this that not all of you are parents. And that's fine. We can all um, benefit from learning how we can better share Jesus with those close relationships that we have. Um, Whether it's a family member, a friend, um, we can still always learn and take these things that we're learning and apply them to those kind of close relationships. And so today we're closing up with the movie Field of Dreams. Um, It was funny when I got the sermon topic for this week, I realized I have that whole list of movies. This was the one I actually hadn't ever seen before. So part of my sermon preparation involved actually watching a movie this week, which was really weird. Um, But yeah, Field of Dreams. um, Going into it, all I really knew was that it's lauded as one of like the great baseball movies of all time. But when I got done watching it, I kind of came to the conclusion that I don't think people really like this movie for the baseball. Like, the baseball is cool and stuff. If you, if you like baseball and you can recognize the people and stuff like that, that's cool. But, like, I don't think that's why people really connect on a deep level with this movie. If it's been a while since you've seen it or you've never seen it before, real brief synopsis of the story. You've got Kevin Costner's character, Ray, and his father. Um, Ray's father, growing up, wanted to be a professional baseball player never ended up working out, life kind of happened, and then he put those expectations he had on Ray. And Ray came to a point he didn't want anything to do with it, and it created this rift between the two of them. And the rift just grew bigger and bigger and bigger as Ray got older, went off to college, and he wasn't able to reconcile the relationship before his father passed away. However, because it's a movie, and after a series of very, very strange events, if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about, it's just a weird movie, um, Probably going to get in trouble saying that in Cincinnati, baseball town. Anyways, so after all of that, he is able to actually reconcile the relationship with his father by getting to play a game of catch with the ghost of his father. And I wouldn't recommend that as a reconciliation tool going to try to play catch with the ghost of someone you've wronged. But I think that's the part of the story that we really connect with more than baseball, is this idea of reconciliation, this idea that we had a broken relationship between a father and a son that was reconciled at the very end of the movie. I also think, too, this idea that we have, we all have these different dreams and expectations for our lives, for our kids' lives, for what our families are going to look like. We all have these different dreams and expectations. And as Christ followers, like Sarah was saying, one of the biggest things and biggest desires is that those who are closest to us grow up knowing and loving and following the same God that we do. So how do we do that? How do we, how, how do we go about have, having them grow up knowing that they love the same God and follow the same God as we do? It's important, and it's important because it's a question of eternity. Because what we know and think and believe about Jesus has an eternal impact, way bigger than just a familial familial issue, because it it does cause familial issues, because it's something so close and foundational to who we are. It influences so much of what we do and how we live that when that relationship isn't there with those who we have closest to us, it puts a bigger rift than something as petty as baseball could ever put between us. So how do we do it? How how, how do we keep those closest to us from straying away? I will be the first to tell you that I have no magic bullet or magic plan for you, because sitting in this room are hundreds of different stories of where we came to know Jesus in our lives. Um, None of us are perfect. I can't give you a formula because you're not going to follow it perfectly, Um, and it wouldn't even work then to how you can keep those closest to you loving Jesus. But what I do hope we can do today is I hope that by opening up God's word, we can find some encouragement, and we can also find some insight. We can be challenged ourselves in how we share Jesus in those really close relationships. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to dive into this. Father God, open up your word for us today. Teach us, challenge us, grow us, encourage us, God. Just help us to depend more and more on you each and every day. We love you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, so go ahead, pull your Bibles out. Throughout this series, we've been doing what we would call more a topical sermon. So we've kind of been like, we haven't been sitting in one particular book of the Bible. We've kind of been jumping here and there and all that. But I think it's important that we have God's Word in front of us, that you can follow along where I'm at so that you see, A, I'm not making any of this up. It's actually in there, and it's in your book too. Um, but also so that we can just get more and more familiar. We can grow that familiarity uh, with the Word of God. Um, I've been working with student ministries as like a youth sponsor since I've been in college. I always really, really love students um, and getting to work with them. And growing up for me, student ministry had a huge, huge impact on my life. I had some really awesome people speak into my life at that age, and they are absolutely one of the biggest reasons that I am standing here in front of you today doing this. But one of the things that gives me the most anxiety about working with students and like keeps me up at night is that moment when we graduate kids, that moment when we send them to college, because it's one of these times that like, we've poured so much into them, we've, we've spent so much time, and then it's the sink or swim, are they going to continue to follow after Jesus, or are they going to walk away from him? And I've seen, I've seen many stick with it and do a wonderful and fantastic job following after Jesus after they graduate, but I've also seen many stray away. And that's a really common thing that we see across churches, all across the board, is this, you know, we're in high school, in, in kind of like our safe home area, and then when they go out, <clears throat> there's, they just walk away. And there's a lot of people who've done work to find out why. One such study was done by LifeWay Research in 2014. And they surveyed a group of young adults, which they defined as like 17 to 19 years old, so like right out of high school, first couple of years of college. And what they found from that group that they surveyed was that 70% of those kids had dropped out of church. And what they mean by drop out of church is that they are no longer regularly attending church or involved or associated with the church. They just kind of drop out. Now, what's even more frightening to me is that of that 70%, 80% of those kids <laughs> said that they weren't planning on dropping out of church while they were in high school. Oh, like, we, we've spent so much time, and like, it can look like things are going so well, and then it doesn't. So what, 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 what caused them to turn? What was the big factor? Was there some like crazy professor who turned them all into militant atheists? That's actually not the case. What was really interesting was as they were surveying these kids, they were asking, like, you know, why? And what they found was that it wasn't for some big theological reason for most of them. It wasn't even like a rebellious streak of rebelling against their parents when they went to college. What they found was something much smaller and more sinister. And that was just that they simply stopped regarding church as an important part or influential part of their lives. And while that doesn't necessarily mean that they've completely turned their backs on Jesus, it's not too far to make the logical conclusion that the further we get from the body of Christ, the further we get from a fire, the colder we get, the further we get from the body of Christ, the easier it is to stray. That's why we see this in Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Go ahead and open up there, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. We find this encouragement. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day approaching. Is church attendance important? Yeah, absolutely, because of this. Because again, it's essential for our relationship, not only with each other, but for our relationship with Christ. Like the further we, the less time we spend together, the less good of friends we're going to be. We've got to spend time together. We've got to remind each other and encourage one another about the truths of Christ each and every day. Now, if you're a mathematician, you might have been looking at those statistics and saying, ah, there's 70% that fell away, but that means there's 30% that didn't. That's awesome. Um, but with that 30% that did not drop out of church, they were asking, why didn't you drop out of church? What were some of the biggest factors in you not dropping out of church when you went to college? And they asked them a whole bunch. There were a whole bunch on the list, like, you know, I had family, you know, I had friends there. I wanted, I just I, I like church. It was fun. But the one that stood out the most to me was this. At least one adult from church made a significant investment in me both personally and spiritually. At least one adult from church made a significant investment in me both spiritually and personally. One adult investing some time made all 
the difference. And we have a fancy church word for this kind of relationship, for this investment, that's called discipleship. You might have heard it before, disciple, discipleship. What does it actually mean? Well, according to the dictionary, a disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines and teachings of another. So to reframe it in our context, that's going to be Jesus. So we would say, a disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines or teachings of Jesus. And we're all called to be disciples. And the trick with this is, as a disciple, we can't just sit over here and say, I believe Jesus. That's only half the definition. The other part of it is we have to go assist in spreading the doctrines or teachings of Jesus. So being a disciple and practicing disciple, being a uh, discipleship is practicing being a disciple, taking that and spreading it as well. And again, we're all called to be disciples. In fact, that's the last thing that Jesus commanded us to go and do before he left earth. We find this in Matthew 28. And some of you might know this as the Great Commission. It starts in verse 18. But Jesus said to his disciples as he was leaving earth, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're all called to make disciples, to go and make disciples. This is what God wants us to go and do. One of my favorite conversations I get to have with people um, is the question, how do I know God's will for my life? And it typically comes up at a moment of like a big decision, like I've got A, I've got B, I've got this college, I've got that college, I've got this job, I've got this other job. How do I know which one is God's will for my life? And the simple and very frustrating answer I like to give people is that. Therefore, go and make disciples. But how does that help? With, like, I've got this college, that college, this major, that major. Like, what, what, what do I do? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying, which is not to go seek out guidance and counsel and to pray about these things. Please go do those things. Those are important. But regardless of what we do, that's our calling. That's God's will for our life, is to go, therefore, and make disciples disciples. And there's times that we just treat God like a fortune teller for our own purposes and desires to say that, God, just help me. But we, 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 stop take, we stop looking at, like, what God has actually already said his will for us is. So regardless of where you go, regardless of what you do, go therefore and make disciples. And if what you're going to go do doesn't actually let you accomplish that mission, and it's incongruent with God's will for your life, that's probably not God's will for your life then. Regardless of what we do, go therefore and make disciples. But that leads us to what and like how are we making disciples? Like, okay, so we're, we're supposed to make disciples of Jesus. I get that. But like, how do we go about doing that? And what are we making people disciples of? I, there's a lot of questions there. Some of the hardest things that Jesus said to people during his ministry were not towards the outcasts or the sinners. They were to people like you and me, people who were good about going to church, they knew the scripture, and generally thought they were good people. He had the most pointed and difficult words to say to people like us. And we find one of the most challenging ones in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Ugh. It makes me uncomfortable. Because these people were not just like, oh, we're just like regularly going to church and stuff. They were doing like crazy things. They're coming and saying, Jesus, we're driving out demons. We're prophesying. We're doing all these like crazy miracles. And Jesus says, you missed the point though. You did not do the will of my father. You were trying to do these other things, but you, you, you missed the point. We've already established God's will for us is to go, therefore, and make disciples of Jesus. So what got in the way? I think 
as we go and disciple, there are things that get in the way. We, we sometimes elevate other things above Jesus. And this is where things are going to get a little bit uncomfortable for just a moment. If you feel like a little bit uncomfortable like in your tummy, like you're feeling kind of weird about things, that's okay. That is good because that is what we need to wrestle through and really ask ourselves these questions. Are we elevating a particular church, a particular pastor, or a particular way of doing church over Jesus? We have our preferences. That's fine. But are we putting those above the message of Jesus? Because what I've seen happen, I've seen it happen more than I'd like to admit, is I see people go with this and they can't get along with other Christians who might do something, they might do church slightly different. They might think about something just ever so slightly different, but it causes this disunity because we can't, we can't get along because they aren't right. But if they're not changing the message of Jesus, is it really a problem? Are we elevating a certain political issue or a politician or a political stance over Jesus? Does, do your political views prevent you from loving and sharing the gospel with someone of opposing views? If you're ever on Twitter, you will see this happens all the time. The walls it creates. You, you see it in our country all the time. Just the different barriers and sides we have to things. Do we put that over Jesus? Because quite frankly, there is nothing we can vote on. There is no politician we can elect. There is no nation that will rise that will save or redeem this world like Jesus Christ has already done for us. Put your trust in him. Mm, this last one hurts. Are we putting our family or relationships over Jesus? Ah, oh, didn't we just spend like a whole series like talking about how to be better families, how to be better parents? And yes, we did, but Jesus also had something to say about that as well. And so you can see that I'm not just crazy and making things up. Open up to Luke 14, verse 26 with me. Luke 14, 26. And Jesus says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Ow! Now, context is very, very important here to understand that the people, when Jesus was saying this at the time, the hyperbolic language of to say that you need to hate your father and mother was understood completely as hyperbole. He's not literally saying you have to absolutely hate everything, including yourself, to be my disciple. What he's saying that is, though, is these are like the closest things to us, our family, our friends, even ourselves. Like, this is the closest things we hold dear. We have to be willing to give those things up to follow Jesus because at the core of it all, none of those things that we just, I went through can be our foundation because they'll all crumble at some point. Churches, churches come and go. Pastors come and go. How we do styles of church, it changes over time. But the one constant should be Jesus. If you've been around long enough, you've seen politicians come and go. Policies come and go. Nations rise and fall. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus is still constant. And even with our families, oh, our families aren't even forever. Our friendships, our relationships, they aren't always forever. In this physical life, they are not forever. But Jesus still can be, and how we view Jesus can have an impact on each and every one of those things. Our foundation needs to be Jesus, nothing else. So how do we go about making disciples. We've been kind of all over the place this morning, but you can go ahead and get comfortable in 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to camp out there for the rest of the morning. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, and just a real quick background so we have a little context going into this. Um, this is a letter written by Paul to the church at Corinth. Um, the church at Corinth was struggling with some things. Uh, they had the influence of sin, uh, some false teachings. They had jealousy and pride and just disunity in general. They were they were a church struggling with some things. That's why they got two books. First Corinthians is really Paul just kind of slapping around like, what are you doing? It's, it's them getting in trouble. And second Corinthians is cool because you get that turn of 
it's kind of the redemption side. Like, okay, hey, bring it in. Let's build you back up again. So 2 Corinthians, we're building the church back up after Paul has just really gone to town on them in 1 Corinthians. And where we're at in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul has just reminded this church that even though in this earthly life our bodies will not last forever, we are just broken vessels. We have a hope inside of us, an eternal hope um, in the gospel of Jesus, um, getting our focus more heavenward than what's around us. So he's reminding them, hey, we have this hope that no one or no thing can take from us. And then he starts in verse 11. How do we take that hope and share it? Verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What Paul's trying to accomplish to here in this little section is he's trying to convey to his readers, hey, th- I do this for no other reason. Because at that point in time, there were a lot of people trying to debase Paul and say, hey, don't, don't listen to Paul, he's kind of crazy, and this and that, whatever, but what Paul's saying is here, I I don't do this for any selfish reason. I don't risk my life for any selfish reason other than Christ's love compels me to do this. What Jesus has done for me compels me to share this and risk my life for you. And that should be each and every one of our motivation. If it's anything else, like again, that foundation is just going to crumble, but the love of Christ, what Jesus has done for us, that gift of salvation he offers, should be the foundation for all that we do. And it should definitely change how we view those around us. Paul continues in verse 16. He says this, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We no longer regard people from a worldly point of view. Because of what Jesus has done for us in light of eternity, we we can't just see people as they are anymore. We see them in light of eternity. And that takes those close relationships we have and just makes them so much weightier, adds so much more depth to them because it's, it's not just about this life. It's a question of eternity. And our ministry is one of reconciliation. Again, with Field of Dreams, what, what makes the movie good is not the baseball. It's the story of a broken relationship being mended. We're called to share this message of reconciliation. I know it's, I'm more visual sometimes, and so like it's kind of an abstract idea. So there's this illustration called the bridge illustration, which we'll do. We're going to have a little Bob Ross moment. You've got plenty of space in your bulletins to follow along. We're going to make some happy little bridges. But this, this illustration, what it does, it just helps, us, it helps me to visualize what Paul's talking about, this message of reconciliation. So what we've got, we've got us, and then over yonder, we've got God. And so in the beginning of all things with Adam and Eve, we had a perfect right relationship with God. However, the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, it put a void between us and God. It broke that relationship. There was sin. And with sin, there had to be some sort of payment. There had to be some sort of reconciliation for what was done. And God was merciful in that he did not just strike down Adam and Eve and say, all right, forget this whole humankind idea. It's just not going to work out. He gave them a way to try and reconcile that relationship by offering the blood of animal sacrifice. But that plan was never going to be permanent. It was never going to work because each and every day they're offering sacrifice. And if you look through, if you look through the Old Testament, you look through Israel's history, the times they got in trouble and they strayed from God was because they, were, they weren't even doing it. They weren't even keeping up with it themselves. But God didn't just leave us hanging like that. He didn't just say, well, you can't keep up with it. Tough luck. What he did was through sending Jesus to die on the cross, this is the bridge, by sending Jesus to die on the cross, 
The person that we owed a debt to, God, paid for our sins with the blood of his own son. That was the final payment for sin. And that's what reconciles that relationship. It is only through Jesus, not, only through what Jesus has done can we be reconciled to God. And how do we do that? That's where John 3.16 comes in. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is that message of reconciliation we take and share with people. So how do we share it? How do we take this out? What are some good tools to share it with? Well, that's one good tool. Um, but Paul, as with any good writer, uses another metaphor to help illustrate this idea of how we are supposed to take and share this message. So we'll continue in verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. There's a lot of parallels you can pull from ambassador to disciple. It's one who's out representing a nation, trying to show other people that, hey, this is who we are. And we're called as ambassadors or as disciples to not just take this, take this and hold it for ourselves and say, this is what makes me feel good. I feel warm and fuzzy because this makes me feel good. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to take and share this message, to share this message of reconciliation and hope we have through Jesus to all. When should we share it? Today. I love how he closes that up by saying, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Each and every day that you and I have breath in our lungs is another day that we can share this same message with people and give them a chance to also believe in it and not perish, but have eternal life and be reconciled to God. Each and every day that we still have breath is a time that we, it is the day of salvation. Be ambassadors of Christ. And therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. As our team comes up, um, there's really three spots I think we find ourselves in in regards to our close relationships. We have those who are still close to us. We still have those who are near us. And with those, I would say, invest in them. Continue to invest in them. It took only one adult investing significantly both spiritually and personally, in a student's life to keep them close to the body of Christ as they left this body of Christ. Be an ambassador of Christ and go, therefore, and make disciples. If they have left, and I'm not saying like they've left and turned away from the faith, if they're just even geographically far from you, stay engaged. I know we have like a million and five different ways to like stay engaged nowadays. It's hard. But do your best to stay engaged with them. Continue to be an encouragement. Continue to invest in them, even if geographically they're not here right next to us. Be an ambassador of Christ and go, therefore, and make disciples. And lastly, if they've really left, if they're really gone, I know it hurts, I know it's painful, I know it's discouraging, but don't give up. That's why... In the Great Commission, Jesus didn't just say, all right, go make disciples and figure it out. No, he, he says this at the very end. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He didn't just abandon us to try and figure this out on our own. We have a God who is good. He loves us. Um, lean into him. Trust him more and more. And be an ambassador of Christ. And go, therefore, and make disciples. And probably sounds kind of vague, open to interpretation. Go be an ambassador and make disciples of Christ. It is. Because this morning, we barely have like half an hour to go through God's word. This can't be the only time that we're opening up God's word because we have to take time each and every day growing in God's word more and more. Because we don't, if we don't have that personal relationship, our kids, our loved ones, those close to us, 
aren't going to either. We've talked this whole series about setting an example. What example are you setting? Be an ambassador of Christ and go and make disciples. Let's stand and pray together.